think everybody is used to hearing these beautiful, melodic, lovely songs from humpback whales. But it's not always nice to listen to. When anyone asks me well, how pretty their songs are, I'm like, ha Ellen Garland is a humpback whale expert from the University of St. Andrews. I have always loved being by the sea and on the sea. Apparently, when I was six years old, I declared that I was going to be working with whales. Whales, like bats, are vocal learners, and their songs are among the most complex forms of animal communication. A single song typically is anywhere from five minutes to half an hour just for one song. So these guys sing for hours and hours on end. Like human music, whale songs consist of repeated phrases and themes made up of individual units. On average, there's about 34 to probably 36 different sound types that we recognize um, within the humpback song repertoire. And we name them how they sound, so moans, groans, grunts, whoops. So we call that a trumpet. We have a lot of low frequency, very grunty sound, and sort of ascending shrieks, so I feel like that one is definitely going to come back to haunt me. <laughs> Which begs the question, why? Why are whales making such complex songs? One clue might be that only the males do the singing. The humpback song is really an acoustic peacock tail. It's extremely showy and complex. They're obviously communicating with each other. You sort of want to understand why they're doing that, what they're trying to say. To find out, Arlen embarked on the world's first mapping mission of whale song. I was to analyze song across the South Pacific region to try and understand what the songs were in multiple populations through multiple years. Across the South Pacific, there are tens of thousands of whales living in separate groups. Until Ellen came along, no one had ever compared their songs. There were so many songs, I couldn't keep them straight in my head, so I started to draw them. And then from there, I could actually lay them down on the floor by population by year. Next, she color-coded the songs. You can absolutely tell the difference between these song types because they have lots of different sounds in them and it's the particular arrangement of these sounds. So this is the blue song type. Now, if we listen to the dark red song, As you can see, this is completely different. Scientists thought that at any given moment, each group only sang its own tune. Well, we thought for a long time that all the males in an area sing the same song, but it, that it's different when you go to different areas. It's different in whatever, Hawaii from Tahiti. So we expected to find that all the songs within a year would be the same. So I started analyzing and I started with the easterly population of French Polynesia. And there were some interesting irregularities in there, shall we say. And I was like, hmm, this seems strange. Strange, because in French Polynesia in 2006, not all the males were singing the same song. Sometimes the whales were singing the red song. Sometimes the blue. And then I went to the next population over, the Cook Islands. And then I got to Tonga. And then I got to New Caledonia and of course, finally, to East Australia. There was sort of a disconnect. The same songs kept turning up, but in different places. I talked with other researchers, and they were like, wow, I've seen that song type. What is it doing over there in that year? What was going on? It wasn't until Ellen mapped everything out over time that a picture began to emerge. Consider the blue song. In 2002, it enters the charts in East Australia. In 2003, it's all the rage in Tonga. 2004, it's a hit in Samoa. 
and by 2005 is number one in the Cook Islands. Meanwhile, back in East Australia, those trendsetters had picked up a brand new tune. All of the males threw their current blue song out the window and started singing this dark red song type. And then once they were singing it, it was then passed to the next population over, which is New Caledonia. And all those males learnt this brand new song type. And again and again across the South Pacific, so to Tonga, American Samoa, the Cook Islands, and finally to French Polynesia. It's almost a game of telephone across the South Pacific. It was kind of like Beatlemania when the, you know, the British invasion came over and transformed American music. And this didn't just happen once. As Ellen dug deeper, she found that this same thing happened year after year. And that was the really big eureka moment. The fact that we see repertoires of song shifting from one population to another across the Pacific and humpback whales um, is, shows that humpback whales have cultural transmission. That's a big deal because culture was once thought to be uniquely human. No one knows how these songs start, but why would male whales put so much effort into switching them? We think that it's something to do with novelty. A novel song makes you stand out against the background of singers around you. You want to be able to stand out to that female and maybe you'll get more matings. But are they just sexy tunes? Could there be any lyrics? 